Okay. Thank you. So we know this meeting is being recorded and a very warm welcome to everyone in the room. I think we have a, a very good crowd of over 100 people so far. I think we've had about 400 registers, so we're quite overwhelmed by the, the wonderful response. So a very, very warm welcome to everybody in the room. Uh, my name is Denise Sin. And I am standing in at the moment for our director, uh, Dr. Oliver Seal, who um, is scheduled to do the welcome to all of you, but he is having difficulty logging on. So in the absence of uh, his, his uh, presence here, let me do the honors of welcoming you all into this space. Um, the first of our um, events in the Helm Engage series. Um, Oliver hopefully will join us soon, but today um, it's a very special occasion, a very special event for us. We don't like to think about this as a webinar because uh, we prefer to think about this as a lively engagement with all of you, and we are quite amazed at the response. So on behalf of Helm, on behalf of Yousef, I'd like to uh, issue a very warm, warm welcome to all of you. Um, today, we will hear Professor Ahmed Bauer, who is going to give us an address. In the background, uh, we will have uh, lots of others in the room listening uh, with great attention to this important address on complexity, leadership, diversity, and equality during this time where we are struggling with so many things. We will hear as the main feature of today's Engage program uh, from our monitoring and evaluation expert, uh, Megan Franklin, who will talk about the findings on our very first Women in Leadership program. Uh, this in fact is going to also be the launch of the Women in Leadership programs report. Um, so we're looking forward to hearing from Megan in a little while. And we're also going to engage with our partners and our participants who were in that program around what they learned and what they found out. And then to end off the program today, we will share about some of the other Helm offerings that are um, presently uh, part of our suite of programs, but also about some of the new events that are going to happen as part of this series. We also would like to thank all our partners. Um, we have, first of all, our 26 HEIs, our higher education institutions, who have been active participants in all of Helm's programs, and in particular, um, 17 of those uh, forwarded people and sponsored people to be part of our Women in Leadership program. And to you, we are extremely, extremely grateful for the support that you're offering into the sector in this regard. A very important partner is the British Council, who um, were willing and keen to assist with this program uh, that is called the Women in Leadership program, as it coincides with some of their own goals and were very keen to support us. And then of course, our partner in the Department of Higher Education and Training, who always come to the party to make sure that the programs that help to build and grow the expertise, the academics, the leadership within the higher education sector, we thank you too for your role and we'll hear a little bit from them in a moment. Um, now, what I don't have is Professor Ahmed Bauer's CV in front of me, but I don't think that Prof Bauer needs much introduction. I think we all know him. We know him to be the CEO of the University of South Africa, the body that um, groups all of the universities and the different strategic uh, groupings that are part of the work that we do in the higher education sector. And Professor Ahmed Bauer has led this organization for the past couple of years after being vice chancellor at DUT. 
and he is an esteemed and beloved colleague of ours. Um, importantly for today's address, he is also a physicist and he brings with him um, understandings of the role that science plays and in particular today's topic that he's going to share some of his perspectives on, on the role of complexity and how that impacts on leadership, on diversity and equality. Prof Bauer, are you in the room? I am, I am. You are, good, good. So if you are fully present with us, I hand over to you and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Denise, and uh, thank you, colleagues, for affording me this opportunity of uh, spending some time with you today. It's, it's just a short time, but I really do appreciate it very much. Um, so uh, you know, today I've been asked to say a little bit about uh, the importance of considering how to deal with complexity in our institutions. And I, so uh, of course, there are many facets to uh, higher education leadership and higher education management and so on. Uh, and complexity has to be one of the key kind of elements in the arsenal, uh, dealing with complexity needs to be one of the, uh, you know, one of the uh, instruments, one of the capacities that leadership uh, has to have uh, in dealing with the uh, uh, leadership at our universities. So I, 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 it's a real pleasure for me and especially under the umbrella of will, which I, I, you know, I, I think is an absolutely fantastic program, and I, I think it's a, you know, it's not just a transformative project. You know, in South Africa, we keep thinking of transformative, you know, this and transformative that, and so on. Uh, I think that uh, will has the potential uh, to be truly disruptive, if you like, in terms of uh, changing the nature of our higher education system. So I'm very pleased actually to be a part of this, and of course to be a part of. Yusuf, which you know, of which Helm is a big part, and uh, uh, and therefore to have been uh, kind of uh, at its inception, if you like it. So thank you, thank you very much again. And I'm going to try and do a share screen now, and hope it works. It's always a challenge <laughs> these share screens. Uh, I hope you can see that. Yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you so much, and uh, so just to say thank you again and uh, hope that the rest of the meeting goes really well. So, um, so, so, so the question really then is, you know, just what is complexity? Why do we have to spend time on it and so on? And, and as Denise indicated, <laughs> um, you know, my passion is physics. And uh, so, so I'll, I hopefully will bring some of the excitement of physics into this and hopefully you'll kind of uh, see the connections if you like and so on. So, you know, we, we have to just remind ourselves that universities are not ivory towers, right? They're not like sort of completely sort of, you know, uh, in a bubble, if you like, you know, they, they exist within context, you know, and the contexts are simultaneously kind of intensely local and global. I know that's almost like a cliche now, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, that uh, universities are very, very connected with what's going on locally and what's going on uh, globally and 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 in terms of the global connections, it's it's not just about the grand challenges facing humanity and so on. It's also about the fact that universities are very much of a part of the family of universities, you know? uh, and we measure ourselves, you know, as uh, as being uh, as being kind of a part of that family of universities. Uh, and and I think that one of the big challenges we have in South Africa is understanding how to measure ourselves. Uh, in terms of our local contexts and and, and, the, and the location of universities within those local contexts. Um, secondly, of course, you know, as we all know, we are involved in the knowledge industry. We produce knowledge, we apply knowledge, we disseminate knowledge. And of course, our core function is really students. You know, and I'll come back to that a little later on. Um, you know, universities are very complex socioeconomic spaces, you know. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we did a study last year, you know, just uh, which kind of indicated that uh, if you look at universities, higher education at least, if you look at it as an economic sector, uh, it's, uh, it sits next to gold mining, you know, in terms of kind of how much it brings in and how much it spends and so on. It's a very large amount of money. So uh, it's a very, they're very complex spaces. And of course, they're deeply complex social spaces, right? Because 
uh, they, they're very diverse. They, uh, uh, they have a very significant kind of uh, uh, um, uh, differentiation. Uh, they, they have historical roots, which are deeply complex. Uh, and that history, by the way, still plays itself out in many respects. And of course, they intersect with other socioeconomic spaces. You know, they 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 really interwoven into uh, into kind of the the context that our students find themselves in in their communities and so on. Um, of course, it's interwoven into complex economic contexts, and you know, there's constantly a pressure on universities, you know, to uh, to contribute to the economy, to kind of produce graduates that can be employed and so on. Uh, and of course, there's a to and fro there. I mean, so you know, we, we are impacted by the economic context, but we hope also to impact the economic context, if you like. Uh, and of course, we all know universities are highly contested spaces, right? and we can talk about that later on. But you know, the, the fact that universities are such highly contested spaces is an indication of just how important they are as uh, kind of institutions, if you like. And of course, the one thing we just can't uh, escape from is the fact that we have universities by definition have very complex internal and external governance systems. They, they, you know, they, we have layers of decision-making structures within universities and, and, and those are necessary. Uh, but what it does mean is that there's very high levels of complexity. And of course, you know, universities, uh, kind of respond to the challenges of uh, kind of national governance, you know, and, and we can talk about that a little later on if we have a chance. Um, so what are the key systemic issues? And I'm not going to spend time on this because you all know these things already. But as I mentioned earlier, we have a continuing apartheid architecture of the higher education sector. And that's something which is, you know, going to, uh, going to have to be addressed, in fact. There's chronic underfunding. We have a really inadequate student funding system. It's really inadequate. We have a broken basic education system. And by the way, you know, I, if you look at the, just look at the numbers, you know, uh, you know, 40% of students that enter grade one never make it to grade 12. You know, that's kind of the years of, if you want to talk about uh, kind of a, 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 a human disaster, that's a human disaster, if you like. Um, there's constant pressure on us for access and constant pressure for success. And that's important, of course. You know, at the moment, we have a 21% 21, 21 participation rate of 18 to 24-year-olds. Uh, the NDP would like us to get that up to 20, 30, to, by 2030, to get that up to 30%, an extra 600 to 700,000 students in the system. Uh, how we will do that is very difficult to contemplate. Um, the state of the economy, of course, is really critical. And of course, if there's, a, if there's a diminished uptake of graduates, that has enormous implications for the system. We have a research innovation chasm. Uh, we have an incomplete PSET sector. I mean, and we can talk about that for days and days, if you like. Um, uh, and then we just have nothing like a national digital teaching and learning ecosystem. So every time we, you know, we have a crisis, we try to go online and we discover that actually all that does is just exacerbate the inequalities in our system. So um, we have a real challenge around African languages and trying to understand how to, uh, how, to, how to kind of really integrate African languages as languages of academic discourse. Uh, and that's something I think which is a fascinating project for South African universities. Um, and there are three really major challenges that USAF is taking up at the moment. The first one is just the issue around the social ownership of universities. How do we improve the social ownership of our universities? Uh, secondly, the issue of long-term sustainability. And the third one is this issue around engagement uh, with the local and uh, global contexts. So um, just uh, please don't worry about the detail in this picture. Just, uh, just look at the picture. I think you all know what a pendulum is, right? A pendulum is like where you have a piece of string with a bob at the bottom. And the bob, you can set that bob kind of oscillating like this, right? So I hope you can see me. I can't, I can't see myself, so I hope you can see me. So, you know, uh, the pendulum sort of oscillates like that. And, and it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of second year project, if you like, you know, uh, first year project, by the way, first year physics project, quite easy to solve. 
of course, it gets more complex if you take, you know, resistance into effect, into context and other things. But basically, it's a first year physics project and you can solve it. And you can do the experiment and you can verify the theory and so on. Now you do something very simple. You add on an additional piece of string with an additional bob at the bottom, like the picture, right? And then you get complete mayhem, right? So what you, the, 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 the picture on the right is really a graph of the motion that is generated when you add on this extra bob. So that simple motion that we had, that oscillatory motion, gets converted into something much more complex. And, uh, and, 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 and basically, uh, there's just no way of predicting, if you like, you know, in a simple way, uh, where the bobs are going to be. Uh, even if you know what the initial conditions are, even if you know where they were to begin with and so on. So, um, so this is uh, this, a very simple, a very basic example of a, chaos, a chaotic system, right? So basically you've just got two bobs, okay? And the two bobs kind of interfere with each other. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today for a minute. So just to, just to indicate what I've said earlier, it's a double pendulum, is a pendulum with another pendulum attached to it. It's a simple physical system that exhibits chaotic behavior uh, and so on. So, but here's what I want you to focus on. When you begin to kind of, you know, begin to try and analyze this, there are three kinds of solutions. The first one, is a simple trivial solution. So in other words, can imagine the two bobs, you know, moving in synchrony with each other like that, or something like simple like that, right? So it's a simple trivial solution, but that very rarely occurs. The second solution is a catastrophic solution. And it's a solution where you just can't find any, you can't find any solution, basically. What you find is chaos. And the third, with a lot of analysis and with a lot of kind of nudging and so on, you can get beautiful complex solutions. So you get three kinds of solutions with these complex systems. So of course, the point is that the more you, the, the more you add on in terms of moving parts, the more complex the situation becomes, right? The more complex the physical, uh, the physical uh, system becomes. So a complex systems, complex systems are highly composite. They have lots of moving parts. Of course, the one I just showed you is a, just has two moving parts, right? With the strings, two moving parts. Uh, they have large numbers of mutually interacting subunits. So in other words, the subunits interfere with each other. So for example, if you take that double pendulum, if the second pendulum is in this position, it pulls on the first, uh, the first bob, you know, in that direction. And then of course, when it swings across that way, it kind of pulls on that bob in that direction. And of course, vice versa, right? So the, it also, the first bob is affected by the second bob and the second bob is affected by the first bob. So, um, so you get there, these are interacting subunits as I refer to them here. And then you get these repeated interactions, which are very, which, which result in, very complex collective behavior. Uh, of course, every time <laughs> the one bob affects the other, there's a feedback, right? Because you know what, they keep interacting with each other. So, so you set up a kind of cycle, if you like. So you have this very rich collective behavior, but there's continuous feedback which changes that behavior. And I'm sure you've all heard about the butterfly effect, which is sort of a not directly related to this, but it is related to this. The butterfly effect uh, really tells you about um, how in a complex system, uh, a little change in one part of that system can cause dramatic effects in other parts of the system. So I'm, at the moment, I'm just talking about simple physical systems. So if you think about universities now, see universities are devilishly complex. Universities have many moving parts, millions of them in fact, right? Uh, they have complex governance systems as we spoke about earlier. They have many internal constituencies, many external stakeholders or many external constituencies. 
they articulate with other parts of the national education system, basic education, TVT sector, the CETAs, the, uh, you name it, you know, um, with each other, of course, universities interact with each other. They articulate with the economy, and that's a major issue because the economy is not, a, is not standing still. It's constantly changing. Universities have to kind of respond to those changes. And they also interwoven into national imaginations, you know, and policy frameworks. I mean, I, you know, I just keep thinking about how we've been, how universities responded to the Reconstruction and Development Program, the RDP, and then with gear. And then, well, first of all, there was the RDP white paper, which kind of changed everything. Then gear. Uh, and then, of course, there was Asgisa. And then there was Gypsa. And then there was uh, the African Renaissance Project. Uh, and then there was, uh, um, you know, uh, well, it just went on and on. And of course, now we've got to come out to help us to come out of uh, out of COVID. We've got the um, the uh, economic recovery and uh, and um, what is it called ERRP? You know what I'm talking about, right? Um, so that's you know that and those are all they all affect the universities. And of course, they are also interwoven into global imaginations. You know, universities don't kind of, you know, we South African universities don't put a bubble around them. I mean, they also interact with international universities. So what this means basically, because of all of these moving parts, there's a high propensity for our institutions to slide into conditions of chaos. Uh, the parts interact with each other in physics, what we would call non-linear ways, you know. There isn't a like one-to-one -one correlation. You know, it's not like if you apply force X, it produces an outcome 2X. It's not like that. It's much more complex than that. So universities are complex, they're multi-layered institutions. They need systemic approaches as we design interventions. And then you know, what I discovered is that they require lots and lots of gentle nudges. You, know, you, have, to be, you have to be aware of what's going on and apply gentle nudges to try and bring things into a solution, if you like. So again, just to emphasize, I'm not going through this again, I'm just saying that you know, these are the things that drive this complexity. And, and of course, one of the, you know, if we compare ourselves with the, with the business world out there, for me, the, you know, the, 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 sec, the one second from the bottom is the critical one, of course, which is that we have customers who are our students, but actually they are also the owners of universities, right? So that kind of tells you how complex this gets, if you like. And, and of course, one of the big challenges we face is, is where in managerialism, we, are, we apply the reductionist approaches, um, which can have dramatic impacts you know, to solutions where they are simply not suitable uh, uh, for, for the situation we find ourselves in. So there's an adage, and it is an adage. So this is not a physics principle, if you like, but there's an adage which speaks of the, the conservation of complexity, right? Which kind of really says that actually the amount of complexity we have in any system is there. You know, you can't kind of increase it, decrease it. So it's there. It's, there's, it's, it's kind of, and, and what you have to do then is you, you can't just simply wish it away. What you have to do is you have to kind of design to take into account that, uh, that, uh, that complexity. So I'm going to start on the right hand side. Um, so the first thing, you know, we can always think about is to design for learning, not just the learning of our students, by the way, that's, of course, what we do, that's our core business, right, but design for the for learning of, of our staff, of making sure that our organizations are learning organizations, uh, make sure that, that people are constantly kind of engaging with uh, the complexity of our universities, so that they are also kind of in the position where they can apply nudges or they can make, uh, you know, they can make integrated solutions. They can provide for integrated solutions and so on. Uh, and so what that does is helps for effective agency, if you like. So learning is, it's not just a, a feel good thing. It's not something just, which is good to have, but it is really quite fundamentally about keeping our systems, uh, giving our, you know, making our academics and, and, and technical staff and administrative staff and leadership, giving them effective agency, if you like. We have to design for integration because uh, the systems, uh, the, the danger we face is that we are constantly 
uh, kind of struggling with uh, with silo defects, right? Because and of course the silo defects impact on each other because of complexity. So it's much better to have an integrated approach across the silos, so, and that provides for simplicity of structures. And then of course we have to design for complexity, and that really is to optimize experience. And I'll I'll come back to that in a second. I know I'm running short of time, so I'm going to. So for me, at least, one of the critical issues is this idea of returning to first principles, just understanding what universities are. Universities are social institutions of a special kind. They're knowledge intensive, and they have students. By the way, that's what makes them special, right? They have students. You know, there are other kinds of knowledge intensive universities, but universities have students. That's our job. They are involved in the creation and dissemination of knowledge. We know all that already. And their primary purpose really is to produce new generations of engaged graduates or intellectuals or whatever we would like to. And then the big question is, what are the characteristics of these engaged intellectuals? And I'm not gonna go through this. This is all about, you know, you can welcome to have these slides, but just saying that, you know, there are purposes like kind of creating active citizens and so on. And then there's building skills, critical skills, critical thinking, building skepticism in our young people, Systemic thinking, if they're going into the workplace, they need systemic thinking and so on. So at the institutional level, if we're going back to first principles, you know, what I would like really put on the table are a set of challenges that we can put on the we can put to our universities. The first one is really in our context, in the South African context, to adopt a strong social justice agenda as a social political rubric. In other words, to say that. We, we really are going to foreground the social justice agenda uh, in terms of our universities and what they do. Um, and the, we have to build new communities of intellectuals. You know, where are the next kind of you know, generation of engaged intellectuals come from? It can only come from the universities. And then they place, we place students at the center. That for me is an absolutely critical issue. So it's like saying, well, let's design our universities around our students. And what does that take? And I've got a whole kind of set of slides, you know, that would speak to that. I'm not going to uh, go through today. And then secondly, it's just this idea that there has to be continuous engagement as a way of integrating the university into those contexts and, and dealing with complexity through ensuring that, that there are these engagements which allow for these nudges that I spoke about earlier. So my final slide. You know, if we design, these are skyscrapers, right? So if you design for complexity, what do you need? I mean, this is just a metaphor, so please don't, uh, don't hold me to, I'm not a civil engineer, right? First of all, you have to have strong foundations, uh, you know, because if you don't have the strong foundations, if you don't go back to understanding the university as a social institution that is knowledge intensive and that kind of has students, then you're in trouble because then you just kind of flounder, right? The second, is this issue around intelligent pliability. This idea that actually you have to design so that if there are shifts and changes and so on, that, uh, that the system can actually cope with those, that there, there's ways in which it can address those. Address those. Uh, the issue of integration, trying to ensure that there's uh, data systems and data analytics, uh, that there's continuous kind of engagement uh, integration that will allow for uh, for systemic approaches that will allow us to kind of work outside of silos so that we can adopt systemic solution we can approach the development of, of uh, systemic solutions and then of course as I mentioned earlier the issue of organizational learning uh, of course it's based on individual learning but the organization has to foster uh, organizational learning it has to foster learning, uh, so that people are aware of how this all works. And then, you know, my favorite, which is something that I haven't seen in any book or anything, but it's one that I think works from my own experiences, is this idea of soft touch, the nudge, if you like. Uh, Denise and Birgit, thank you so much. And that, that was useful. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm happy for you to share the slides. And uh, if there are any questions, you know, I'd be happy to take them, but I'll, Stop the sharing now and hope that that was good for you. 
Thanks, Prof Ahmed. And uh, Oliver's back with us, so we're going to have him uh, just say a few words. Thank you very much, Denise, and thank you for stepping in. I had some technical issues uh, getting in, but I'm here and great to be here. As always, always fantastic to hear you speak. Uh, my leader, <laughs> my CEO at Youssef. <laughs> uh, I think it's so it's so encouraging, you know, that, that you bring a, a kind of passion to the work that we do. And I think the, the focus on complexity and, and yeah, we thought university was just like any ordinary organization. So I think as someone once said, the detail is the devil. And so it really comes to thinking uh, at the level of the system of the organization and the individual. Unfortunately, uh, we, we don't really, we have time for any questions, and, and, uh, or, but we picked up some of the comments in the chat and we, we picked that up later in, in the following session. But thanks so much, Prof, for your time. And, and as always, your, your, your significant input. Uh, it really set the scene for a really exciting uh, engagement this afternoon. Thank you very much. And thank you. You're welcome to stay with us, but I know you have a very busy life. So if you, if you need to leave, we, 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 we really would will excuse you and, and, and thank you so much for your, for your input. Take care. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you. I have to leave, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. And colleagues, uh, it really gives me pleasure now just to hand over back to uh, Professor Denise Zinn, who is our program leader for Will. Um, she really is, is uh, at the, the head of, of what we've done and achieved um, in the World Program together with a magnificent team. So over to you, Denise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oliver. And uh, before Prof Bauer goes, he might be gone already. I just need to let him know that there was a comment in the chat that said that was the best explanation of complexity that she had ever heard. So uh, it, it actually came from one of, of our participants. Um, and, you know, it sort of illustrates just how important this particular topic has been to us, even within the Women in Leadership program. Um, and I, I want to thank Prof Bauer also, because it actually formed the focus of one whole session, and we actually took those four elements and thought um, the, the, the four, well, and the five with a soft touch and actually got our participants to look at what does it actually mean in terms of practice. But let me get back to my brief, which is uh, just to, to just do a very quick introduction to the Women in Leadership program. Um, this first engage uh, um, event that we are having is really uh, showcasing and launching the review of the Women in Leadership program. And Megan, whom I'll introduce in a moment, will provide an overview to the program and uh, give some high level um, um, information on how it works. I'm not going to go into that. Um, I just want to say a few things before we start. And the one is just how much I wish that we would be seeing all of you in a room, because I know that if we were all in the same room, we'd be hearing applause for Prof Ahmed's uh, introduction. And I miss that. And so I'm imagining all of you applauding uh, this, this introduction that, that he gave to us. Um, but also, uh, I'd like to see the faces of all of our participants. I know they're there in the audience. So welcome to all of you and lots of other friends and colleagues who are part of the session today. Um, I think uh, just a few things I want to highlight before I hand over to Megan. I think it's really just important to indicate what some of the important design aspects of the program were. And they kind of pick up on what Prof Ahmed was saying. And the one is, first of all, that we started this program from what's become a phrase in our team now, which is leading or starting from the inside out. For us, it was an important distinction in this program that we wanted to get, we, we wanted our participants to have a sense of self of who they are and what it is they have to offer, what the experiences are and the sense making. So that was our starting point in the design of the program. A second important principle um, was in fact the foregrounding of the complexity paradigm as a concept conceptual context within which and from which we are trying to make sense of the world and the nature of our work, particularly within leadership roles. 
So we developed and implemented the world program in ways that try to respond to that complexity and the fast and ever-changing context which was happening as we went along in the program. A third important principle or area, and for those of you who know me, you will find this next piece familiar, the utilization of principles of a humanizing pedagogy in the program uh, and in all of our sessions. And, and some examples of that was not coming in with deficit notions of women's capabilities. This was not a program to fix women. Uh, it was the importance of establishing trust and safety and laughter and relationship and a social consciousness. These were all important aspects. And to do this, we incorporated music and dance and poetry and reflection and art and time to think, to discuss and debate, uh, to relate the ideas that came up to the context in which participants were immersed. These were important principles and elements throughout the program. We also, uh, as another component, wanted to learn from women leaders currently in the higher education context, both locally and, and internationally, who have traveled similar paths to those in the room. And this happened in every session. We had women leaders who demonstrated and spoke to what they had encountered in their own journeys. Uh, another important principle was to ensure that there was diversity in all aspects of the program. We think diversity is not a nice to ask. It's, it's fundamental uh, in terms of local and global perspectives, multiple disciplines, um, multiple ways of learning, different kinds of people and personalities and presentation styles and so on. Uh, uh, a, a sixth component was the criticality of context and institutional cultures as the ground upon which transformation emerges and is made possible. And so this was interwoven. And then seventh, developing a consciousness, consciousness of one's own agency and capabilities as a contributor to change. So these were interwoven elements and principles throughout the program. Now there's of course so much more to say but hopefully other aspects will emerge through engagement uh, with our respondents later through Megan's review. And of course, from our huge room full of participants in this event, thank you so much to all of you for attending this. And please feel free to ask questions and make your comments in the chat as we go along. I would like now to hand over to Megan Franklin, who has become very dear to us in the way in which she was willing to open up and engage uh, and shift in, uh, in different ways um, as we continue to think about the program. So she's from the company, her own company, together with a partner called Measure. Um, and we look forward to her as we launch the review and evaluation of the first Women in Leadership program under the auspices of HELM. So thank you and over to you, Megan. Just waiting to get the um, her re her recording up. She has recorded this. Um, she is present, but she has recorded it because there might have been an emergency that she had to attend to. So we are going to be showing the recording. Are we ready? I'm just waiting for Andre. Okay, so Andre, our, our uh, techie behind the scenes, is starting to put this up. And if you are wondering about the dancing, we really did dance in this program and the program participants can attest to that. Um, it was great fun. Um, you might have seen on the screen while we're waiting, some of the poems that were written as well, they were, they were looping at the beginning 
And I think our Howl Music has started screen sharing. So over to Megan and the recording. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. We're going to have this in a moment. So we will we will have Megan doing it live from Cape Town. Oh, um, because, great! Because yeah, somehow on the tech side, um, there seems a hiccup. We give Megan a okay. Second. Much better. Megan, can you put your camera on as well, please? Yes, certainly. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much, Denise. My name is Megan Franklin, and I'm the co-founder of Measure Research and Evaluation. Uh, Measure is a social science research and evaluation consultancy based in Cape Town. And over the years, we've undertaken quite a bit of M&E and research work within the higher education space. Um, one such higher education project is this uh, Women, in, Women in Leadership project. And I am delighted to share the high level findings emanating from the review process with you today. I'm hoping to provide you with a sense of the high level uh, learnings arising from the review with a view to stimulating conversations around leadership development in the higher education sector. I'm going to start by providing an overview to the program and then talking through uh, the, the, the review purpose and methodology as well as the results and some recommendations arising. So, the role of women leaders in universities is front and center in many global higher education systems. The South African higher education context faces ongoing challenges relating to gender equality and the access of women to senior management and leadership roles. It's against this backdrop that the Women in Leadership Program was born as part of the HELM program offerings and it was piloted in 2020. It aims to advance gender equity in the leadership of the sector by providing bespoke learning and development opportunities for women in middle and senior management positions at public universities in South Africa. So in terms of situating the world program, it's useful to acknowledge the various personal and contextual factors that exist within individuals and institutions in the sector. Will is therefore premised on the idea that the development of leadership capacity and confidence and confidence building will embolden women to advocate for themselves whilst they navigate and excel in leading diverse teams to shape change within the higher uh, education context. As such, the design principles, as Denise has mentioned earlier, um, underpinning the program are important to highlight. So firstly, Will is informed by and designed to address these key personal and contextual factors in the sector. The program does this by drawing on international best practices related to similar programs, as well as on training needs assessments that HELM undertakes in order to ensure that it remains responsive to prevailing challenges. Thirdly, it builds on the foundations of leadership program and admission into will requires participants to have first completed that program. And this program provides participants with an outside in overview of higher education. Will is therefore designed to start from the inside out and foregrounds the unique competencies, needs and contributions of each woman engaged in the program, as well as the dynamic and complex context in which they live and work. Will focuses on the, on the process of transformation at the personal level, um, and this emphasizes um, huge, uh, human agency and social justice, which allows space for thinking and exploration on how change can be affected in these spaces. Its pedagogy also promotes self-directed learning, where feedback and participation form an important part of the, of the learning process. And Will underscores the role of self-reflection and provides participants with resources and a framework to facilitate reflect, reflective learning practices. 
So how is the program implemented? Well, um, it, it is managed through various mechanisms or components that aim to facilitate this personal transformation. These include facilitated sessions, peer learning groups, coaching sessions, assignments and journaling, as well as a cumulative portfolio. Will commenced in September of last year with a diverse group of 26 participants from 17 institutions. So in terms of the review, the review purpose and scope, the British Council and USAF co-commissioned a review of the World Pilot Programme, as well as the development of an ME framework. So in the absence of an existing measurement framework, the review sought to articulate the program's design and implementation, as well as identify its successes, particularly as it relates to the ways in which participants had expressed personal and professional growth as a result of will. The team was interested in exploring the immediate impact of the program on the participants and then exploring whether and how the program produced, provides a long term foundation for participants to contribute to transformation initiatives in their spaces. Moving forward, HALM intends to undertake evaluations of subsequent cohorts to gain a longitudinal understanding of the possible impact on individuals and institutions over a longer period of time. The review methodology entailed the collection of primary data that was used to supplement the available secondary data. We reviewed program documentation, including cumulative portfolios where we received consent for this, and we engaged with program staff and partners. So in efforts to maximize the opportunities for participation, we invited participants to engage in um, either an electronic questionnaire, individual interviews, and or focus groups. Um, 15 unique participants provided input, input across the various data collection strategies. So in terms of limitations, load shedding unfortunately happened at the same time and uh, several interviews were interrupted. Um, furthermore, participants' personal and work-related commitments sometimes clashed with the scheduled participation in this, these data collection efforts. And lastly, the review overlapped with the planning stage of the second world cohort, which meant there was a limited time for program staff to incorporate the findings and recommendations of the review into the planning of the next cohort. So what did we find? Um, I'm going to unpack the high-level findings with regards to the design, implementation, and the results. So in terms of design, um, feedback from participants confirmed that the program is relevant to their needs and to the prevailing higher education context. In describing their contextual challenges prior to enrolling in the program, many spoke of grappling with structural inequalities related to gender and race that have become institutionalized. Secondly, uh, key motivating factors identified by participants for enrolling in Will aligned with those identified by the program staff relating to the need to access a community of women in higher education and to find support from and solidarity with other female leaders. Many participants experience Will's overall design through the content, components and the support as an integrated holistic program, thereby confirming its feasibility. I've got two quotes on the screen, um, and I think the text might be a little bit um, small, so just we'll read one, one of them for you. Um, the experiences that I was going through in my current space really nudged me to, to participate. I had gotten to a point where I, feel, where I felt quite isolated, gender, but also the race aspect of it. I always say that one has to manage the double whammy of race and gender, and it doesn't get easier. It actually gets quite difficult the more one progresses in your professional space. So in terms of its implementation, um, the program has been widely, sorry, has been positively received and experienced by all the role players. So due to COVID-19, the initial program was adapted and this was thoughtfully executed. Overall, participants were highly satisfied with Will's program offering and design, its content and structure, and the reflective nature of its delivery. Participants responded um, sorry, participants, where was I? I reflected on how the structured and unstructured opportunities for self-reflection deepened their experience and that they felt safe enough to share of themselves in the process. The coaching has been cited as a major success, particularly in terms of being a mechanism for self-reflection. And the peer learning groups were also successful as they created spaces where participants from familiar contexts um, could share their, their work and life experiences. The program staff reports a close to perfect attendance and no attrition during the six-month pilot, and all participants submitted a cumulative portfolio. 
there were some challenges identified in the process, um, and these related on a high level to the effect of COVID-19 on, net, on networking opportunities and the ability of um, the, the participants to focus during this time. Related to this, some participants experienced connectivity issues with the move to more online modalities, and there were also a few component-specific aspects that have been pulled into recommendations for the team going forward. So in terms of understanding uh, the results emanating from, from the review, um, we, we thematically analyzed the data that was collected and broadly grouped the themes into immediate short-term changes that participants experienced with regards to personal and professional development, and then those that seemed to relate to more longer-term individual transformation and growth, followed by examples and experiences that related to changes in their immediate and broader contexts. So within the lifespan of the six month pilot, all participants could share or articulate changes to their personal and professional development. And these relate to enhancing self-reflection and self-awareness, um, strengthening leadership capacity and capabilities, establishing networks and relationships, having an enhanced understanding of the higher education context, recognizing the value of self-care and reflecting on their career trajectories. Individuals could also talk to a deepening of the individual transformation by seeing the same things differently, uh, by proactively striving towards professional goals, and by strengthening of strategic relationships. Lastly, some participants shared activities and plans that they have already implemented in their contexts and or that they are planning to implement. I'd like to take a few minutes now just to talk through each of these and provide you with some insight into, this, uh, into their experience. So in terms of um, personal and professional developments, participants shared examples of how specific sessions contributed towards increased levels of leadership awareness, knowledge, and skills. Participants report that the program provided a space to explore the complexities and characteristics required when taking up leadership positions. Many examples were provided of how participants have a greater awareness and appreciation of the complexity of managing within systems and systems thinking. Many examples were also cited of how self-reflection has led to an enhanced sense of self. The emphasis on reflective thinking and the sharing of experiences was highly valued by participants, who explained that this had provided a space to think about themselves in new and different ways. The significance of self-awareness became clear as participants shared how leadership styles are learned and very much based on a person's understanding of themselves and their identity. Participants spoke of how the various components of the program contributed to enhancing their self-reflection and self-awareness, and many noted their appreciation of, and often surprised at, the impact of reflection during the, the, journaling, ex during the journaling exercises. So the establishment of a network through the program was noted as a significant outcome for, for some participants. Many formed close relationships with other women in the peer learning groups or in the broader group, and they valued the personal nature of these relationships and the support they received. Participants shared how feeling part of a collective that shares similar experiences highlighted the need to strive towards change. Some participants indicated having an increased awareness of and or a, new, a renewed appreciation for how the systemic cha challenges in higher education directly affect women. Participants shared that there's also a tendency to operate within silos and that Will highlighted the importance of keeping an interdepartmental and institution-wide perspective in as far as it, as it facilitates improved operations. There was an overarching theme that participants largely prioritized work and that self-care was not something that many of them had invested in at that time. Will provided an, an opportunity for, for participants to explore their potential and their desire to advance further in leadership positions within their institutions. It inspired some to strive towards expanded career goals and solidified the rationale to remain in current positions for others. So in terms of individual transformation and growth, this seems to have taken place at a varied pace to, based on the individual, uh, with some participants requiring more time to reflect and internalize the learnings and others being able to implement, implement more quickly. So in terms of a shift in self-perception, 
there were instances where participants described seeing themselves now as potential change agents who could pave the way for others. Will shifted the way in which participants viewed their power or lack thereof, with many noting that they were more empowered within their context since participating in the program. Participants also spoke about being intentional about their professional goals and how they had been strengthening strategic relations, relationships. So in terms of, of understanding changes related to immediate and broader contexts, participant feedback has revealed meaningful personal and professional changes in the ways in which uh, participants viewed themselves within their context and their positions. Many report how these changes have started a ripple effect in their immediate and broader contexts, either as plans they are intending on actioning in the foreseeable future or as activities that they have already undertaken. Participants spoke of being inspired by the program to become champions for other women leaders or future leaders within their spheres of influence. They felt a sense of responsibility for the development of other women to join the ranks and recognized the need for solidarity with other women leaders to influence positive systemic change within the sector. In essence, Will created a microcosm of how participants could replicate different components of the program in the real world amongst their colleagues or stakeholders. For instance, continuing, continuing with coaching and endeavoring to provide informal coaching to colleagues in their own contexts. So against this backdrop, how do we move forward in terms of understanding the will change process? So it's gone through a number of iterations um, in terms of, of trying to map and understand um, in the beginning, it was quite a linear process and it has emerged over time and grown and developed. We're at the point now where from the review, we are looking at, at showing the, the changes through the use of concentric circles to show the interconnectedness of the changes that have occurred and, and how these could emphasize the importance of the self in relation to the context, as well as how individuals realize their agency and start to proactively apply strategies to address these in their contexts. What we understand is the cumulative effect of personal change in terms of increased self-awareness and enhanced leadership capacity and capability, and that these can have catalytic effects in the immediate, in the immediate and broader context in which participants operate. These changes are also felt by others as participants start to plan for and action changes. So we've superimposed the kinds of changes to evidence through the pilot program on the right-hand side of your screen. And this serves now as the start of a conversation with the team around mapping possible change pathways that the program can track and understand better over time. So in, in the interest of time today, I'm focusing in terms of recommendations um, on those that Helm um, um, and, and the broader stakeholders could be taking up um, for, for um, will and future programs going forward. So essentially, Helm should continue to enhance and strengthen its role in the higher education sector to support systemic change. Um, and this could be done by serving as a resource for career pathing within the higher education sector and providing oversight to the transformation process for the sector. Coaches also recommended that universities should, should create environments that are enabling for women to thrive by, amongst other things, creating safe spaces for dialogue and embedding coaching opportunities in leadership structures. In terms of recommendations from, from the evaluators, um, Will should continue to be responsive to the prevailing needs as identified by future participants. It should also continue to advocate for management buy-in into foundations of leadership and Will to ensure there is sufficient interest and representation from all higher education institutions, and also to ensure that participants are sufficiently supported during and after the program. HALM should implement the m and &E framework arising from the review process in order to determine the longer term impact of the program. It should also examine ways in which to acknowledge or share the promotion and advancement of women in the sector by possibly tracking past participants and showcasing career successes within the sector. As HALM considers Will's expansion, it's important also to examine what is not being done and what target group is not currently being sufficiently serviced through Will and other interventions. Um, and this is part of, a, of a, uh, a set of recommendations around expanding some of the kinds of programs in the sector and how the, the design of those programs could be strengthening and reinforcing each other's outcomes. And that brings the review summary to a close. 
I wanted to take this opportunity to also thank the participants who were able to engage in the process. Thank you for your input and for sharing your lived experiences. Um, I do look forward to the discussions that will emanate from this input as well as those from the other speakers. Thank you so very much. Over to you, Denise. Thank you so much, Megan. And once again, I'm imagining all of you applauding in the room. I can hear it, you know, it's reverberating in my head. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Megan, for your, your presentation. Um, the, the full report will actually, or the executive summary at least, will appear on, on the Helm website. So thank you very much for, um, for that, uh, Megan, it was so thorough. Um, and we are now going to hear from the respondents. That is the view from the external evaluator. And we be now looking forward to hearing from some of the respondents and the stakeholders in this program. Um, the way we're doing this is we have tried to approximate the idea of a fishbowl methodology. Uh, we're trying our hardest here to get as close to uh, imagining ourselves in the same room. So imagine a fishbowl and we're going to have a small group uh, of participants, stakeholders uh, voicing their views in response to Megan's presentation. And I will invite the participants to put on their cameras now as I introduce you to each of them. So first up will be two of the world participants in cohort one, Professor Sebi Lekalakala, who is Dean of the School of Health Sciences at Safako Mahato University. Um, and the second uh, followed by uh, Professor Fosina Nyatanga, who is Associate Professor and academic leader in economics at UKZN. Third up will be Dr. Tandi Lewin, who's the acting DDG, University Education in the Department of Higher Education and Training and one of the Helm World Partners. Fourth, we will hear from Jean September, the Deputy Country Director in South Africa for the British Council, another key partner in this program. And the fifth respondent will be Becky Smith, Assistant Director in Advance HE, another international partner in this first iteration of the World Programme. So a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, you're all now in a fishbowl. Everybody can see you. You can't see what they're saying or thinking, but it's going to be great to hear from each of you. So please do keep your microphones and your cameras on for the duration of the session and I will invite you one by one to participate. So first up is Professor Sebi to provide her comments on what stood out for her or had greatest impact on her from the World Programme. You have five minutes, Prof, over to you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Prof Zin. I'd like to say hi to everyone. This is first a great opportunity for me to, to give this five minutes of my presentation. And probably just to say to, 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 to fellow women uh, that, are, that are on this platform that how I, how I really got into Will was that uh, I'd already attended the helm uh, in 2019. And uh, being the only female dean then and, and today at that stage, um, I found myself um, really compelled to be part of listening to how women really manage in terms of their leadership uh, in higher education. I was always puzzled by how all the, the four males, uh, deans got uh, what they wanted without any effort. And, and I thought that, you know, uh, something was very wrong in terms of how I asked. But eventually, and, and it probably also through, through, through Will that I realized they're not as smart as, as, smart as a lot of us think they are, and uh, my apology to, to, to Oliver if he's here, <laughs> I've got nothing against men, but the bottom line is there's just so many things that, that women really seem to not get, uh, get right and, 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 and with really no plausible explanation. So I'm really thankful for the opportunity offered to me. I could have applied and been overlooked by, uh, for this program, but hey, the universe agreed and I'm very grateful and thankful to, to God for that. And when, when, when I was asked what is it that stood up for me, I actually thought it was uh, leading from my strength. And that on its own has been echoing. I probably went back after I agreed to uh, and started writing 
in, 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 in reflecting on what I thought stood out for me. And to my greatest surprise, I realized that even uh, at the point of where I submitted my, my portfolio, I, the, 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 the leading for my strength quite came out quite quite strong. So one thing that, 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 that we really started by, you know, realizing as, as women was that we, there was an exercise where we were then shown how uh, some of our powers were revealed. We were actually all surprised. The amount of power that we had and that we didn't know that we actually had. And, and out of that, it showed me that leading from the strength does not mean that you abuse your authority uh, as a leader, but you as a leader, you work from the strength, really, really, mean, working from or leading from your strength actually means that you work from your comfort zone. What it actually means is you draw the strength from those attributes that actually you have as a woman, as a leader. And people that do that tend to be happier, they tend to be more effective, they also tend to engage. So naturally, we as women, we actually have those good attributes. And, 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 and we have to actually have to identify our natural instinctive way of thinking, feeling, behaving. In other words, our own natural talents. Imagine being able to consistently operate from a higher performance levels over a long run. So does that mean do you, when you lead from your strength, means that you, you are leading from your weaknesses or you, you ignore your weaknesses? No, that doesn't mean that. What it actually means is that you, you sort of improve your weaknesses. And, you know, for me, my weaknesses has always been attention to details. Yep, I might have been doing very well in other aspects, but when it comes to, you know, um, planning all the details carefully, I, I actually fall short. But um, this program taught me that, you know, our weaknesses should not define our leadership abilities, but, uh, uh, but our strengths. And that, you know, you one needs to actually complement your, your weaknesses by actually, you know, having people and a part of your teams to help you work with and do the, uh, all of those things. So wh what, what also stood up for me was when we had those phenomenal, powerful women that presented um, uh, our Professor Mtos, who actually gave us a very empowering speech. And when he said that women allow the system to abuse them all the time, and said that, and she actually said to us, we were always uh, begging for positions. We, we operate from a position of begging and saying, can you give me, when we actually have all the good qualities to just grab things and move on. And, and she actually said, well, what we want, how we want to function as women is that we need to be able to function within a toxic environment, just as any other person. But what we need to, have to do is to focus on the agenda, your own agenda, and that you focus on conquering those uncharted territories. Territories, and she actually went on to say, we need to learn to fight a good, to fight and for, and fight a good fight for our own positions, and just don't listen to people who talks about. It. I think we always want to be validated, and that always delays us. So, and more than any other thing, when she said, our job is just not to hold grudges. You don't have time to do that. That will deter your 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 progression. So, whilst I was talking about leading from from your strength, from 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 one strength. It was quite clear for me that that can only be done if you link and you combine that with your emotional intelligence. And, 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 and as we all know, your, your emotional intelligence forms a bigger part of putting your strength to, to work. I just need to check how many seconds I still have. Just I think the second. time is up. Thank you, Prof. Sebi. I think. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think. Thank you, Prof. Sibili. Uh, there is so much to say about this, but hopefully people have now seen you and they will uh, converse with you in other ways to find out more about what you experienced. Uh, we now move on to Prof. Fustina Niatanga. Uh, Prof. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Dennis. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we okay. can. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, and thank you for the introduction. So, um, as uh, Denise already pointed out, uh, I'm an academic leader in the School of Accounting, Economics and Finance. Um, 
it's a position maybe that is unique to UKZN, but maybe in other institutions, maybe it'll be the head, head of department or head of section. Um, so I was one of the two female participants who, was, who were chosen by my university to participate in the Women and Leadership Program. Um, and what excited me about, uh, most about the program when I registered was that it was tailor-made for women um, in leadership uh, in institutions of higher learning. And all these women, my understanding was that they are also pursuing the same career path as I was. Um, what was also exciting was the planned trip to Bath, which um, I was so excited to take with the group of women that I was to be participants with, uh, though the trip never materialized due to COVID. Uh, and then the other thing that stood out uh, was exciting for me was the opportunity to network, um, the opportunity of networking, which came with the program. Um, now, as you already know, like our academic um, environment, um, like oh, academia in general, as well as leadership in institutions of higher learning um, is still considered as maybe what we call a boys club of some sort. And socially women in the space, we know that um, as is the case with other professions, we tend to have to overcome a number of obstacles which tend to be a hindrance to our pursuits. So in uh, universities uh, or in positions that we are in mostly which are lower management is that there is fear of highlighting or showing um, the existence of such hindrances just in case you are called out to be an unfit candidate or um, to be hiding behind uh, the discrimination mantra. So what was good about the program is that um, we got to, I got to meet other women who occupy the same space, uh, same intellectual and career space as myself um, and my fears were not unwarranted as they were shared by uh, the same female colleagues. So when we started the program at that time, I was very frustrated with management, uh, especially upper management. As I said, I'm in lower management. Um, I felt that, of course, being at the bottom of the management in any institution um, and worse of being a woman um, was a hopeless uh, position. Uh, it was, I, I felt hopeless in terms of uh, whether I could really influence any change or whether my voice could really be heard. Uh, I felt it wasn't being heard. Um, I also felt that uh, overwhelmed that being in lower management with shrinking resources, um, you tend to be doing most of the work, both teaching and in management. Um, so I was constantly questioning myself whether it is possible for me to advance uh, uh, as a man in management in, or I just revert to being an academic. Um, so we already know that academia is already taxing um, career on its own. Now add management to that and uh, it can easily become a nightmare. And now add the politics uh, around um, the gender um, debate uh, it can actually be something that discourages one. So through this program, uh, we were exposed to quite a number of leadership theories. Um, what the theories that stood out or the things that stood out for me was uh, the complex thinking uh, or systems thinking that had never occurred to me uh, to realize how complex it is even for senior management uh, to lead these institutions. So we also had as uh, my colleagues have also talked about the life experiences of other women, uh, participants, uh, their success stories. Uh, we had class discussions uh, or group discussions in smaller groups, uh, psychometric exercises whereby we could evaluate, uh, we, we could get to know more about each other, about yourself. Uh, we did a lot of writing, self-reflection, peer discussions. Uh, we had coaches that uh, were very crucial in our journey and most importantly, like to understand the concept of work-life balance and self-care. So through participating in this course or in this program, I came to understand and appreciate the dynamics uh, forces that operate in the environment that we work in. Um, and just to highlight just a few um, is the type, what a manager is, what it means being a manager in the institution of higher learning. 
that uh, this is kind of like merging two careers in one, academia and management. Uh, and with academia, you have a responsibility towards pretty much the search for the truth through research and no real obligation to respecting the opinions of others or care about their feelings. But in management, the primary requirement of this is to, um, to be sensitive to, to, uh, to people's concerns um, and to also think beyond or anticipate uh, beyond what um, is already given to you at that particular time. Um, <clears throat> Um, I, I had listed quite a number of things, but I think like maybe my time will run out. Um, with, but uh, talking of the peer groups, I think one of the things that was good about the program is that the peer groups were just not only um, allocated, or you're not only allocated your peers just randomly. Um, in my group, we had a senior, somebody who was more senior than others. So we had a, well, I was lucky that in my group we had a DVC. And we could learn a lot from the wealth of information that she already had in the experiences. So we talked about usually in institutions, like in this management positions, the people who bring you down sometimes are not even the men, they are other women. Uh, so we talked about what we call the queen bee syndrome that we find in institutions of higher education. And how do you deal with that as a manager? How do you deal with other women? Um, and one of the advice that she gave us, which I can share with you now is to give women power, you know, like uh, give your colleagues the power. Uh, sometimes you hold the power when you're in management, you hold the power and you say, it's mine. And I would, uh, people have to do as I say, but if you, give, if you have the power and you give people who you lead power, uh, especially even the females, we find that your work uh, or your life becomes much, much easier. So I've implemented some of these uh, advices and it has worked magic for me. Um, in the coaching um, that we did, uh, I had to tap into the experiences and uh, of my coach uh, who was well experienced uh, in the management position. Um, and I had to, I learned to, um, I, I learned to, um, I, I learned to, uh, many things about being myself. I learned, I had to tap into myself. One of the things about being, one of the things that we all shared with the colleagues, the other women in the program was that for us to benefit from the coaches, we had to be vulnerable. We had to open up to them and tell them our experiences and uh, then learn from them. But from Thank this- you. Bukina, I'm gonna have to, oh, Bukina, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm gonna have to stop you. Denise, I'm gonna go over to you. In fact, I'm going to ask that our next, I think it's time for you, Dr. Lewin, if you want to share with us, we can move on. I'm just worried about time. Okay, thank you. Oh, <clears throat> thank you. Sorry you got cut. I'll probably, the same thing will happen to me. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how, well I, how long I, my input is. Uh, I've just been finishing it now. Um, but good afternoon to everyone and, and thanks for asking the department to participate in this meeting. Um, it's really exciting to see how big the participation is in this Helm Engage uh, webinar. Um, it says a lot of see such high numbers. Um, perhaps also uh, about the high levels of interest in this kind of program. And I think it clearly emphasizes to us that the Helm program has value and is required in this sector. I think this is important. and. Um, uh, it's important that uh, we see this about Helm. I think the networking opportunities that are available, building the overall capacity of the sector, building learning about what we're doing um, through Helm into the regular work of the sector is really important to us. I hope that we can be able to continue to provide the kind of support that will build the Helm program to become sustainable over time. And I'm very interested in how the World program will develop as well so that it becomes a solid long-term resource and support for the public higher education system. Um, I was gonna, uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the issues. I, I, I think that um, uh, Ahmed talked about the expectations of higher education and higher education institutions. And those, those also put uh, extreme expectations onto women leaders and managers in, in higher education. And he rightly talked about highly contested spaces. I think that, we have very high expectations of women in higher education. I think the 
the expectations of higher education itself have particular implications for women uh, and particularly women who are in leadership positions um, and even more so for black women. Um, I think they're, they're really very high demands and often quite contradictory expectations. And um, I can't come close to the physicist's explanation of chaos theory at all. Uh, I'm not even sure that I understand it uh, completely, but <laughs> in policy studies, um, there's a concept of wicked problems. Um, mm. You know, social problems like the challenges facing our, our country around gender inequities are, are certainly wicked problems. That wicked policy problems are complex matters to address. The solutions are not clear. Um, the information uh, about possible impact of interventions is limited. There's no one definitive understanding of the problem or solution. Um, a, a women scientist has explained this about the lack of women in science. It's what a scientist would call a wicked problem. You pull at one thread and discover 10 more just as unsolvable. So the question is, is, um, does Will, is Will gonna answer all the problems? And I don't think so, but it can make a significant impact on the transformation of the system. And um, not just demographically, but socially and culturally. And I wanted to just focus a little bit on that because the, the, the work that uh, Will is doing around you know, talking about sort of pluralistic and inclusive institutions. I think that this program really could uh, begin to, um, as much as it has a focus on women, it really could begin to help us provide a deeper understanding in the sector of gender inequality in higher education. Uh, what, what, uh, what are organizations uh, doing in relation to gender roles? Why, is, why are our universities not keeping up with certain areas of social change? Maybe it's because we expect more of universities than other types of organizations. Um, but I do think that the program offers us an opportunity to study this and understand it better. Um, how do gendered ideologies operate in our organizations? There are, uh, there's evidence from so much literature and I see from the participants here that there's a number of people who have in fact written about this in their own academic work um, who are in this space. Um, mm. But you know, ideas of domesticity and ideas about ideal workers and how jobs are shaped around those things. The, the, the research that's done on micropolitics, um, everyday working lives and microaggressions that are experienced in institutions. How, how does that uh, relate to, to the work that this program is doing? I think that there's a lot of evidence that there, definitely the work expectations of the current era are unrealistic. We expected to do more with less um, there's an increased demand for accountability, which on the one hand is a very good thing, but it is certainly tough for people that are operating within institutions. There's a growing complexity that has been spoken about by many here already today. There are increasingly blurred ba boundaries, particularly in the COVID and the post-COVID world, if there will be such a post-COVID world. There's a lot less time for sleep. And certainly it's also a more competitive uh, higher education environment and world. Um, they also, I mean, and there's a great deal of growing literature around this in the high, in certainly in South Africa, intersectional challenges about the, and, and, and global literature on this as well, in, in terms of issues around class and race and how they intersect with gender um, inequality. And um, the idea that we are somehow as women, a homogenous group is, is, is clearly not borne out by the research that's been done and by people's experiences. Um, and, and this is something that has to be addressed systemically um, and it needs to be acknowledged and I'm sure it is through programs like this. Um, I just want to read you a quote from one of the recent publications. It says, part of the dilemma has to do with the most almost invisible nature of informal institutional cultures within departments. These function to reinforce and sustain hegemonic practices spaces and traditions of the academy that are exclusive to already marginalized bodies. These cultures and communities of practice are so invisible as to render any challenge and resistance almost impossible, precisely because one would have to first undertake the work of making the invisible visible. Mm -hmm. um, if you, in case you know, that is Peace Kigua, who is a, a psych professor of psychology at, I think she's still at this. Anyway, there are other issues around retaining women um, in the academy, the res re resistance and reluctance of many to move to move up the, 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 the ladder, um, the tensions between individual choices in the career and structural inequalities. Do you fit in or do you opt out? There's growing literature on that, of course, as well. 
Um, so I think there's a need for programs like this to, and they can, open up the discursive space on gender and organizations. Of course, there's all other uh, 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 issues around, for example, the reality of imposter syndrome and how that affects women, but not just women, other people who have been marginalized from higher education. Um, you know, the, the limit on aspirations, um, the limit on, you know, the evidence of adaptive preferencing where, you know, people adapt their preferences based on what they know, um, what, what is real for them in the space. So, so just in terms of thinking going forward quickly, because I don't know where I am in my time, I just wanted to make a couple of points. One is, I think these pro this program is fantastic in providing the time and space for reflection for individuals, for them to be able to articulate and understand professional identities within a context and providing uh, uh, individuals a space to reflect on their organizational roles and the organization themselves. No doubt about that indeed. And uh, no doubt that it's important also for women to do that and to have a safe space to have those discussions. But I just wanted to challenge on some other questions. Can we, do we need to do something different, a more disruptive program? And this is not uh, necessarily for this discussion, but it is a discussion that we need to grapple with in the sector. Um, the importance of professional identity work is, is, is acknowledged, I mean, but it's quite complex. I and mean, there's a lot of evidence that women face quite fractured identities um, and, and, and mental health challenges in higher education, um, not just women, of course, but others who have been marginalized. And um, there are also ideologies around leadership um, and how identities are formed in organizations where leadership is so competitive and so performative. And leadership itself is a very gendered field. So um, I'm also interested in how this program is also helping us to move away from glib expressions of gendered leadership characteristics, um, which make things often more difficult for women, where women are supposed to take on both so-called masculine and feminine leadership capabilities. And one can just get extremely lost in that. I, and, and, and as society, I think we have unrealistic expectations sometimes. Um, Louise Vincent talks about making the normal strange and I guess have a, a question around how this program can begin to do that. Um, and, then, and then just to maybe a sort of final point is around um, the difficulty for programs like this is how, how do you move from the individualized experience, which is so important and so important to understand and to provide space for engaging with that, to engaging the social constructions within institutions. Um, and we have to be very careful to fall into this trap. I think this is a bigger question for the organizers and ourselves as the department. How do we get institutional conversations going, bearing in mind, of course, that it is not only the responsibility of women leaders to engage these kinds of discussions. And the question that Denise raised earlier about, are we fixing the women or are we fixing the university? Um, uh, that comes from a Birkinshaw and White paper. I, I, I certainly think we should be fixing the universities. Are we training the women or are we training the institutions? We're training women leaders to be transformative, but to do so in what kind of environment? What else can we be doing? Um, Louise Morley, um, who probably also many of you have read about, read her, her work um, over many years, she urges that we should reimagine the acad academy. Uh, a goal should be to make the academy gender free. Leadership roles appear to be so overextended that they represent a type of virility test. We need to ask how leadership practices can become more sustainable with concerns about health and well-being, as well as competitive performance in the global arena. In other words, we need new rules for a very different game. So I guess the question I would ask is how can we learn from this? Do we need a sharper focus on gender equity and policy? How can we make institutional changes as well as having the space to reflect ourselves on our own uh, professional identities. I'm, I'm convinced this program can have an impact on this. Um, I see um, Bernie put a question around involving men. Now, I, I think we need different kinds of spaces, but I'd be very interested to know also about how, you know, men can also be involved in these discussions because um, without involving everyone, we're unlikely to really shift institutions um, and we'll just be shifting ourselves. Thanks a lot. I hope I didn't take too long. No, thanks, Tandy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Liu. And that was uh, really, I put it in the, in the chat, really provocative insights. And um, just prepare yourself to be invited into the program. I know we promised you that we would do it last time, but we were too uh, working off the back foot for most of the time. But this time, you are going to be in the program. So 
prepare that uh, lovely, um, lovely provocative insight uh, to share with the rest of the group. So thank you. From, uh, from Dr. Liu, and we go to Jean September from the British Council. We look forward to hearing from you, Jean. Yes, thanks so much, um, Denise. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be working in partnership with, um, with the whole team on the Women in Leadership Program. And we look forward to developing our mutually beneficial partnership. Um, this program, and you know, let's be clear about it, is a groundbreaking gender transformative initiative. And we certainly commend the University of South Africa, USAF, and the Department of Higher Education and Training for spearheading the development of this much needed program. And particularly also that it happened at a really difficult time in the midst of a pandemic. Our lives have been turned upside down and inside out, but the program managed to, and I'm almost sure the interactions with, um, with, with the, the um, academic staff and, and with the participants was most welcome in this, um, in this sort of madness that we had, we had found ourselves and continue to find ourselves. So what makes Will different from other leadership programs? And I quote from the um, conceptual framework document of the women in leadership. Um, it says the programmatic shift we are aiming to make is from empowering women to cope in the working world where women may represent a minority. And our aim is towards the championing and the empowerment of women as transformational leaders of diverse teams who shape the very context within which they operate. The focus of the program is to enable women to be more insightful, visionary and innovative leaders who create environments in which diversity and creative excellence thrives in their universities and within their public spaces. And that is a huge ask. And, but I think, you know, with the kind of leadership that is displayed in terms of the program itself, um, we'll get there and um, small, small steps at a, at a time. Now, these sort of cutting edge and innovative approaches support women academic leaders at university and encourages deeper reflections on their personal and professional development. And that is at the heart of what the program is, is about. Um, will embodies the values and behaviors of our own equality, diversity and inclusion policies in the British Council. And it aligns with our objectives and priorities as we strengthen the mainstreaming of gender in our work, but it also challenges us to how we engage with others who may be different to us and how we continuously challenge our assumptions our biases and our prejudice, and how we listen to the diverse and different voices to gain new and more diverse perspectives, be more inclusive and create new narratives. Um, now through this review, um, and thanks to, to Megan and, and the team, um, it is also an opportunity for all the partners to reflect not on what was achieved only, but how we reach this milestone. And maybe there's something in there that we need to take forward and um, and 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 explore a little bit a little bit more. And um, and sort of lastly, we would we look forward to learning more from the review about the immediate impact of the program, but also looking forward to seeing the cumulative impact of this work in the long term. And maybe just to, to end off, I know we, we, we're, running, we're running a bit late, um, maybe, maybe a call 
um, to all colleagues, we have smart and capable, hardworking and diverse groups of women academic leaders in our universities. How do we step up the campaign to make our universities more inclusive of women at senior levels? Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jean, for those thoughtful comments. Um, and the partnership with British Council is much, uh, much appreciated. Um, and I think through this partnership, we were able to uh, work with Advanced HE. So our last fish in the bowl is Becky Smith. Um, you, you were a wonderful golden fish, Becky. So uh, we'd like to hear, we'd like to hear your comment. On the uh, thank you, Denise. Thank you. I've no, not been referred to as a fish before, but uh, I don't mind that. So um, good afternoon, everybody. And I'm delighted to be invited to join you today. And uh, my organisation, Advance HE, was equally delighted to contribute towards the success of the pilot of the World Programme. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Advance HE is a member led sector owned educational charity and we work um, with the global higher education sector to improve higher education for staff, for students and for society as a whole. Um, our work is centred really on improving teaching and learning, leadership and governance and equality, diversity, and inclusion. So we have really strong uh, practice and uh, work in those core areas. And our focus is really about driving change through structured development programs and also through providing recognition for achievement. So um, some of you may have heard of the Athena Swan Gender Charter, and this encourages change at the departmental and institutional level. Um, and we also run development programs for individuals themselves. And I think both of these things um, tie in with what Tandy was saying really about the need to have um, a sort of a two pronged approach uh, when we're tackling some of these issues. So um, from our point of view, um, we brought to, to the programme, I think um, a global perspective um, to add to the regional and localised perspective. As an organisation, just so you're aware, we actually work across five continents. Um, we touch um, around 100 countries uh, in terms of higher education. So we draw um, on what we're finding in terms of evidence and best practice to feed that into the knowledge of what we share then with others. So it was great to hear uh, that the integration of global and regional perspectives um, came through as a very um, much appreciated part of the program. And um, Advance HE actually contributed to two of the nine modules in the program itself by providing um, technical support and also adapting something called a She Leads workshops for the program itself. And it was a privilege really for us to work with Helm to be able to combine the, the global experience and knowledge that we have um, with the, the contextualized local input that they were able to provide. And just to give you an example of how this was done, we actually incorporated the voices and experiences of women leaders from around the world with those of uh, South Africa. So vice chancellors, um, DVCs, registrars were brought into the programme to share their own experiences. Now the She Leads workshops themselves that we have used um, in a number of places were actually first launched in Uzbekistan. And this was actually a collaboration with the British Council. So it was really great for us to be able to, to work together again uh, as part of this programme. And it's not stopped there. Um, so following the contribution to Will, um, we've actually been able, because of the pivot to online um, and because of the success of the model of what we're doing, is to actually further develop these programmes. Mm. And most recently, um, we've actually been able to deliver this in Bahrain alongside um, members of the Supreme Council for Women there. So I think it's really important to understand the global context that these types of programmes are not happening in isolation. And in itself, this program was also built on something that's been very successful in the UK and Ireland called the Aurora program, where over 8000 women leaders have now been developed. And what's interesting is that we've conducted longitudinal research 
um, over five years to see how much that has impacted those individuals. And it's been really positive in terms of the benefits. And some of those things echo what's come through from the review today in terms of the findings there. So it's really um, had a lot of impact on personal growth, confidence levels, network development, uh, individuals promotion and salary gains have also been impacted compared to a control group um, that was analysed as well. So we really recognise how important the components of this programme which have been mentioned, such as giving time and space for women to reflect, to develop and to strengthen their own networks for women um, across in terms of that solidarity uh, that they provide, but also to be both championed and to champion others. Um, all of those things have come through both in our research and also in the review today. So I think it's really important that we recognise that these kinds of programmes act as a catalyst for regional and international communities of women in higher education to really grow and blossom further. Higher education extends beyond borders, we know that, and many of you will probably spend part of your career or some of your career outside the country as well. So it's important that we understand the wider ecosystem as well. So what I really hope, and I, and I know we've already started talking um, with our colleagues at Helm about this and, and also the University of South Africa and the British Council, is that we can really grow and build on this network and bring stakeholders and individuals together to develop this community of women who focus on these issues related mm. to leadership. We're looking um, really to, uh, I guess, build on the, the leadership in relation to women's strengths, their self-awareness, their knowledge of purpose, and we wholeheartedly support what is happening here with Will and also with Helm Engage. So thank you very much for allowing us to join in and participate and bring that global dimension to the programme as well. Thank you so much, Becky, uh, for, for, for bringing in and, and for being there as, as part of the international component. It added, it added so much and we were hoping we'd meet up with you in Bath but that was not to be. And I think that uh, many are disappointed. They're saying this program will not be over until we have gone to Bath, but uh, who knows when, when that will, will be. So thank you very much. And thanks to all of uh, the, the respondents. Um, your, your comments were all extremely thoughtful. Um, there were lots and lots of comments in the, in the chat room. I've got to ask Birgit, whose camera is on, whether there is time to do uh, a round of questions and comments or whether we have to close off now, because I see we are losing people, but also we've got to get to the last component of today's session. Yeah, I'd like Birgit? that. I think in chat, everybody here can read that there's a lot going on. There's quite a few that I'm picking out. I'm offering emails for various comments that are going on. So I think we leave the chats and we move over to Oliver if everybody's happy with that. The one thing I would like to ask you is if the respondents here in the room would like to respond to each other. Let's give that one minute, please. So respondents in the room, we're not going to be uh, responding to the questions that came through on the chat, but do the respondents in the room want to uh, have any just last literally one sentence comments or to each other so that the fish in the bowl actually do discuss as in a fish bowl? Anyone? So so the comment that you can focus on is perhaps a lot came through on Tandy's comments about how women meant to um, reshape the higher education sector um, with men, of course, being in that sector. And how do we think about um, confident and confident uh, and assertive women vis-a-vis um, -vis the kind of alternative and the corrupted sort of version of the sort of Queen Bee syndrome? So perhaps people can speak about the role of men in this kind of um, women in leadership transformation project. Um, would anybody like to say anything? I, I think we're sort of getting, oh, Becky, are you wanting to say something? Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think what we've found is it's absolutely essential. And I think that was what I was alluding to in terms of talking about the, the championing of and, and by um, participants as well, that um, I think 
what we've seen is that that there needs to be that encouragement and there needs to be systemic um, mechanisms put in place in order to um, enable women to, to drive forward if that is their choice. Uh, and I know that some of women actually made the choice that they want to stay where they are. And I think that's perfectly valid. Um, but I think we, we recognize, and in fact, some of the work that we've done in relation to COVID has seen that there have been barriers that have, have really inhibited women from moving forward. And they do need those barriers to be brought down in order to actually encourage the drive for, for example, promotion or moving forward in their careers, whether that be research or um, teaching or whatever that might be within the academy. Um, for example, um, we saw with COVID that deadlines um, were actually quite challenging for, for research um, funding because of um, things such as um, the, the need having children at home because of the homeschooling that was going on over that period, for example. So there needed to be some kind of reflection and it was often um, our, our, the men within the organisations who were actually controlling that and being able to actually release that and open that up, extend deadlines, those kinds of things, they may, they may seem small, but actually make a massive difference towards encouraging women to move forward and to actually progress their careers. And equally, women have a role to play in supporting those of others as well. So I do think it has to go hand in hand and be both both parties, both genders. Thanks very much, Vicky. I think those are, are really valuable comments. I am watching the clock. It's now 10 to 4, and I think we want to try and close off before 4 o'clock. So um, I just want to say thank you to the participants in the, in the fishbowl for your really valuable comments that provided insights on a number of different levels and from a number of different perspectives. Um, to, to close off the, the, this particular session and to hand over back to Oliver, I just want to do a couple of just closing comments um, because what becomes clear in these comments and discussions, including those on the chat, is that there is a vast arena to explore when it comes to women's leadership in higher education. There's so much more to say and even more to do. Uh, in World 2, the second cohort in this program, we will be commencing this program on the 24th and 25th of August, and it will then uh, take place over the rest of the remainder of this year. Uh, even though Megan said we haven't had a chance to incorporate the recommendations, uh, we have, in fact, set with the recommendations as a checklist, and we are incorporating those things into the program, the suggestions that have come from the participants, from the stakeholders, and, and even from you today, uh, the kinds of things you have said. I hope that some of you in the audience will be part of that program, and we look forward to engaging with you there. Um, and just to close, I'd like to make the point that gaining a gender balance and gender equity in higher education cannot and will not be achieved by women only programs like this one. This is the point that's been made by Tandy, by Becky, by all of you. Uh, the lack of equity in higher education is not a women's problem, nor is it a problem with women. The problem of inequity that exists can only be dealt with by men and women jointly by examining and addressing the culture in our institutions and creating the changes that will make higher education fertile ground for success for both women and men. This culture change needs to be owned and prepared by the collective leadership of women and men, not by women as a separate group. Um, and so to end off, I want to read one of the poems from uh, amongst the many that were actually produced as part of our reflective uh, exercises. Um, it, it did get shown at the beginning, but it is such a powerful poem and the participant isn't here today. She was, she had signed up, but obviously was taken away to other things. And so I haven't got her permission to, uh, to say her name, but I, she has given permission for us to use her poem. So the poem is called Be Brave, Persist move forward. Draw strength and support from your sisters in the room. All of them are an inspiration, a cohort of successful women. You're not alone. The journey will be long and arduous. Too few women at the top, especially in healthcare. There's much work to do. Be brave, persist, move forward. 
there's much work to do, especially in healthcare. Too few women at the top. The journey will be long and arduous. You're not alone. A cohort of successful women. All of them are an inspiration. Draw strength and support from your sisters in the room. So with that, I hand over to our esteemed director, Oliver Seal, to end off today's session. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you very much, uh, Denise, and, and thank you to the world team and especially um, to our, our speakers, our participants, our guests. We had some international guests uh, from the UK, from the US, our, some of the colleagues have joined us. So that's been really fantastic. Um, we really want to respect your time. So we'd like to certainly end the session on a high. This has been the first of our Engage uh, series, which will take place on a monthly basis. But of course, uh, as I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Helm, I need to say a few words on, on Helm and what lies in store for the rest of the year. So I will just share my screen and don't worry, I'm not going to do death by PowerPoint. I only have two slides and, and um, I will talk to them very briefly. Right, so very briefly colleagues, um, just so you know, those of you who don't know of us, we are now have a, our website is live at helm.ac, www.helm.ac.za. And essentially our program um, for this, this phase supported by our partners, um, the British Council and the DHET in particular, Department of Education and Training through the University Capacity Development Program was around revitalizing and repositioning our, our universities and particularly the issue of complexity. I think we all know the only constant these days in our university is increasing complexity and change. And there's three focus areas uh, for Helm. Whatever we do in Helm is based on evidence. So there's a very strong focus on research and scholarship and that's in the area of governance, leadership and management really to inform policy and practice. Then our program curriculum design and architecture is very interactive, education, executive education modality. Um, we have a foundations of leadership program, which really is onboarding for HODs, heads of departments, heads of schools, directors of administration. Then we do specialist courses and our deep dives, uh, Will is one of our deep dives that we we've launched now and we'll, you know, we will start with the second cohort in around August this year. And then we have, um, we're planning a master's and a PG dip in our education management, especially for those uh, who are in the administration divisions of university uh, universities and, and don't have a qualification in university leadership and management, and then workshops and seminars. I think the important thing is um, also the support services that we provide. We're experimenting with a new concept called the High Education Lab. But if you uh, connect to our website and you sign up and you subscribe to how at uh, www.helm.ac.za, you'll see some more information about this. Uh, important to note, I think the, 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 our mantra at Helm is for universities by universities, and it really is drawing on the capacity that exists within our universities. We don't um, try to avoid using you know, uh, consultants to do some of our work. We have some fantastic uh, associates that are working with us. We've appointed some really great program leaders. So they, by extension, um, our team, and we're also supported by a fantastic internal uh, leadership and management team. And there uh, is just a schematic of what Helm will look like into the future. We're starting uh, with induction and onboarding and foundations of leadership. Our full program um, is really meant to bring people on board into their role as head of department, as dean, or head of school. We're also planning to do a MOOC called Hello, Hello as in High Education Leadership Management, uh, Leadership Orientation. That is really uh, what we'll make available to, to give people an orientation to what leadership is in complexity and change, and that will be available by the end of this year. And then our senior middle management programs, we've got the Women in Leadership Program, we will be doing an academic leadership program, executive leadership and governance program, the Dean's program is coming, and so we're working on that, so watch the space. Our specializations around student success, we've got an exciting project called ULEFU, and ULEFU stands for 
University Learning Futures Project. And so we will be rolling that out uh, in the remainder of this year with, with especially focusing on digital transformation, technology mediated learning for the um, historically disadvantaged institutions working in partnership with, with, with other universities. Our lecture development program, ULDP, will, will start off in earnest in 2022. We are starting the planning process with master trainers, uh, which will be initiated later this year. And then, of course, our focus on student success. Uh, we have established a student success collaborative forum, um, and that will uh, be a placeholder for all the activities that the university is doing and how we can provide support for the leadership manager in that space. The Masters in PG Dip is in progress, and uh, um, you, you hear about that as we go along, um, as we uh, share on our website. Very strong focus on, on coaching and mentoring. And then, of course, um, the, the, what you are a part of, a party to today, um, is our Engage series. Finally, um, just so you know, our next Engage event is on the 31st of August. It's a Tuesday afternoon. 2 to 4 p.m. We encourage you to sign up, bring your cup, cup of coffee. Unfortunately, we can't provide coffee and cookies, so you'll have to bring those yourselves. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a fantastic list of speakers again, headed up by Pro Professor Abdul Karim, Professor Tabor Mocha, and then also Professor Linda, Linda Ronnie will be talking about the CAR study, which is the COVID academic research study, which will really focus on the impact of COVID on academia, and especially in, 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 in the sphere of, 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 of the staffing arena. And that's happening um, on the 31st of August. Uh, we'll communicate with you um, from two to four. Finally, again, you're encouraged to, to register on the Helm website. There's exciting stuff there. I'd like to thank all of those who contributed uh, my fantastic world team. Uh, I mean, I. I, I, I always say, uh, I was told by one of my mentors in a previous uh, position, you appoint the best people uh, for the job and when they succeed, you stand on the sidelines and clap. So I can happily clap for, for this team, but also for our technical support, for those who were responsible for arranging this really exciting event. And also for our partners, again, the Department of Education and Training through the UCTP program, uh, our partners, uh, the British Council, and others who have been contributors, advance HE for your contribution to this program. If you can now, I'd like if you please switch on your cameras so we could all just say au revoir, goodbye. Uh, please switch on your cameras and we can wave to each other uh, as we say goodbye. And um, I'm sure, I'm confident, I'll put my money on it that we'll see you all again on the 31st of August at our next Helm Engage event. 31st of August, please diarize it from two to four is our next Helm Engage event. Goodbye, everybody. Take care bye -bye. and good bye, luck. Have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-b